Good afternoon. My name is Kelly. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. I'm a software engineer on the analytics engineering team at Etsy, and I mainly work on improving our experimentation platform. Um, today, I will be talking about how we handle a common problem in A-B testing, peaking at data early. Um, I'm currently getting over a cough, so I'm, I might be coughing a little bit during my talk, and I hope you don't mind. Um, First, uh, let me give you a short introduction to Etsy. Etsy is an online marketplace for handmade craft and vintage goods. We don't own any inventories ourselves, but we connect sellers and buyers from around the world to each other. And our items range widely from a $5 pin to a 50,000 engagement ring. Um, and for each item, Etsy gets 5% listing fee and the rest goes to our sellers. And here are some of our numbers. Uh, we have 2 million active sellers, 34.7 million active buyers. Last year, we had 3.25 billion GMS, which stands for Gross Merchandise Sale. GMS is one of our key metrics. If the $50,000 engagement ring gets sold, that's $50,000 GMS for us. And as of the end of March, we had 50 million items for sale. And what is A-B testing? A-B testing is where a company wants to assess whether a change of feature or algorithm is effective or not. When a user goes on our site, they can be bucketed into one or multiple experiments, depending on the mutual exclusivity of the experiments. And the design of how that bucketing happens can be an entirely different topic by itself. Um, but after, um, but after a user is bucketed into a specific experiment, they can be in either the control or variant group, and there could be more than one variant. For example, if we want to test the effect effectiveness of a button color change, a user who goes on our site might see either of those two button colors. And A-B testing is really everywhere, from big tech companies to small non-tech organizations. Companies like Etsy, Facebook, LinkedIn, Amazon, we have our own experimentation platform and specific team to manage the platform. But for smaller companies, Optimize the Qubit and others offer them ways to take advantage of A-B testing as well. It's also very researched A-B testing, uh, very well researched. Um, many different companies and institutions have published papers on their platforms and the challenges that they've faced. And at its root, A-B testing for online marketplace takes inspiration from running clinical trials. And the problem that we're looking at today, peaking at data early, is also a problem that had troubled the medical field for a very long time. Um, in A-B testing, uh, what we really want to determine is to see if the metric we care about, for example, the percentage of visitors who actually buy, uh, is different between the control and the variant. And we can do this by looking at the p-value, which indicates the frequency that we will see a difference as big or bigger than the one between A and B when there is no underlying difference between the two. Um, and when the significance level is low enough, for example, 5% is industry standard, we say that um, our results are statistically significant, and we reject the hypothesis that A and B are the same. So you might think that we can just collect some samples, check the p-values, and if the experiment and if the metric we care about has a p-value below 0.05, stop the experiment, right? Like what the what, what this flow chart represents. But this is exactly what peaking is, um, because for the p-value to be accurate, we have to have fixed the sample size in advance and only look at the p-value once, like what this flow chart represents. Um, peaking at data and stopping an experiment early increases the rate of false positives, because you would think that there's a difference between A and B when there is not. And um, also, the more we peak, uh, the more false positives we would get. And let's look at an example. Suppose we run, a, run an experiment where the conversion rate is 50% and we accept the false we accept 10% false positive rate. Uh, we consider the case in which B converts at 50% as well. If there's no peaking, in other words, the uh, sample size is fixed, 
then uh, we get approximately 10% false positive rate. However, if there is peaking and we check the and we check the p-value at every observation, then after 500 observations, there is a greater than 50% chance of incorrectly stating that A and B are different, which is five times the expected 10%. Now, checking at every observation is a little bit extreme, but you get the point. And at this point, you might think that the simplest way to solve the problem would just be to fix the sample size in advance, run the experiment, until the end before checking the significance level. However, that is just not practical for fast-moving companies like Etsy because the, experiment, because the opportunity cost for a long experiment is pretty considerable and we would prefer to stop an experiment at earliest to leave space for other experiments. And also, sometimes it's difficult to predict the effect size our users want um, before the experiment. And um, as the and the analytics engineering team at Etsy, our goal is to provide experimenters with accurate interpretation of their data as soon as possible. So we tackle the peaking problem from two sides: um, the platform and our users, who are the product and analytics teams at the company. In terms of platform, we transitioned from traditional fixed horizon testing to sequential testing. Sequential testing computes the probabilities of false positives at each stage. And since we compute those probabilities, we can then adjust the test false positive chance at every step so that the total false positive rate is below a set threshold. And I will be mentioning conversion rate more, so I want to briefly define conversion rate. Conversion rate is the number of conversions divided by total number of visits. So if Etsy received 10,000 visits and has 1,000 sales, that's 10% conversion rate. And baseline conversion rate is the current conversion rate for the page that we're testing. And we investigate a few sequential testing methods, including methods that use an alpha spending curve, uh, such as PCOG and OBF, which are heavily used in cl uh, running clinical trials. Um, for these methods, they compute, they compare the z-score to an alpha spending curve and stop an experiment early when the z-score is greater than alpha. And we also consider sequential testing using difference in successful observations. And that is the approach that we ultimately settled on. Um, and our implementation of this approach is influenced by uh, a blog post that Evan Miller wrote about. Um, and I would encourage you to read that post. And I had a link down there, but it's being cut off. Um, but it's just called sequential Simple Sequential A-B Test by Evan Miller. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, and so this method sets a threshold for difference between the control and treatment converted visits. Um, and based on two things, one, the minimal detected effect, and second, target false positive and negative rates. If the experiment reaches or passes the threshold, we allow the experiment to stop early and if not, we assess our results using the standard approach of power analysis. What this creates is a continuous p-value threshold curve for which we can safely stop an experiment if the p-value is under the curve. And the difference threshold is only valid until we reach a total number of converted visits. As you can see, uh, this threshold is lower at the beginning and converges to our significance level. Um, for here, it's 5%. Um, this allows us to detect changes quicker for metrics with low baseline target. And for metrics with high baseline target, it also allows us to not miss small changes. Uh, and we also consider some weakness this method presented and try to mediate them. Um, first, traditional power and significance calculations use proportion of success. But looking at difference in converted visits does not take into account total population. Because of this, we're more likely to reach the total number of converted visits before we see a large enough difference in, com uh, 
in converted visits from metrics with high baseline target. And this means that we're more likely to miss a true change in those cases. Um, also, this method requires extra setup when an experiment is not evenly split across variants. And the adjustments we made to try to account for those shortcomings was first, we developed a haircut equation to apply to the effect size in metrics for experiments that we decided to end early. Um, and second, we set the standard of running experiments for at least seven days to account for different weekend and weekday trends. And to validate our approach, we tested on results from experimental simulations with various baselines and, and effect sizes using mock experimental conditions. Um, at Etsy, we have over five years of historical experiment data, so um, we, we simulated ex experiments from our historical experiment data. And when we did those simulations, we really wanted to understand those three questions. Um, what we found out was that when using a p-value curve tuned for a 5% false positive rate, our early stopping threshold does not materially increase the false positive rate, and we can be confident of a directional change. But a downfall of stopping experiments early is that with an effect size of less than 5%, we tend to overestimate the impact and widen the confidence interval. We also saw that for experiments which would take three weeks to run using a standard power analysis, we could save at least a week in most cases um, if there's a real change between variants. And, this, and that helped us to feel confident um, that even with a slightly overestimation of effect size, it was worth the time savings uh, for teams with low baseline target metrics because those teams usually struggle with long experimental run times. And um, in our platform, we really wanted our stakeholders to have access to metrics and calculations throughout the whole experiment. Um, and in an experiment, besides p-value, we also really care about power and confidence interval. Power is the probability that if there is an effect of a certain magnitude, we will correctly reject a false no hypothesis. And our definition of an experiment being powered is when it has 80% power. So, and we use power to help us calculate how long an experiment will take to run. For example, if an experiment has reached target change but is under power, it probably means that it needs more data. And confidence interval is closely related to p-value. It's the range of values that are a good estimate of the true value. In the context of A-B testing, for example, if we run the experiment millions of times, 90% of time, the true value would fall in 90% confidence interval. And when we talk about confidence interval, we really care about three things. First, whether the confidence in interval includes zero, because that maps exactly to the decision we would make with the p-value. Secondly, the smaller the confidence interval, the better estimate we have. Um, and thirdly, the further away from zero the confidence interval is, the more confident we can be that there is a true difference. So previously in our AP testing tool, we displayed data in a table like this. Um, there is an observed column for the, control for the control and a percent change column for each, um, for each variant treatment. And in the, percent, in the percent change column, we just display the actual number for percent of percent change. And when we hover over a number in the percent change cell, there will be a popover table, and it shows the observed and actual effect size, the confidence level, p-value, and the number of days that we can expect to have enough data to power the experiment. Um, however, always displaying numbers in the percent change cells could lead our stakeholders to peek at data, uh, to, um, peek at data and make incorrect inference about the success of their experiments. So we decided to only show the, the actual number when we are confident that there is a real change. And for all other cases, we would display messages such as waiting on data, no change, not enough data. 
And in the hover over table, we also added a row to indicate the actual power um, and included a visualization of the confidence interval and color the confidence interval with different colors to indicate the size and position because those are the things that we care about. And in the header of the hover over table, uh, we decided to dis display different messages. Um, for example, we will, um, if we were really confident, we say we're confident we've detected a change. Um, there are also messages like there's no detectable change, metric is not powered, we need additional data. And if early stopping is reached, but the experiment is not powered yet, we say directional change is correct, but magnitude might be inflated. However, even after making those user interface changes, making a decision on when to stop an experiment and whether or not to launch it is not always simple. And here are some advice that we general, generally give to our stakeholders um, around experimentation. Like we ask them to think if they have statistically significant results that support their hypothesis or are not what they anticipated. And if they if we don't have enough data yet, can we keep the experiment running or is it block blocking other experiments? And even if the metrics don't show anything negative, um, is there anything broken in the product experience that they're testing? And if we have enough information on the main metrics overall, do we have enough information to iterate? For example, if we want to look at impact on a particular segment, which could be 50% of the traffic, then we will need to run the experiment twice as long as we had to in order to look at the overall impact. And finally, I want to talk about some other issues that my team considered. We thought a lot about the trade-off between power and significance, because between false positives and false negatives, there is, um, if we decrease the probability of one of them, the probability of the other increases. In other words, if we require stronger evidence to reject a null hypothesis, aka requiring a smaller p-value threshold, then there is a smaller chance that we will be uh, correctly rejecting a false null hypothesis, uh, resulting in decreased power. But at the end, it's just a choice that we have to make based on our priorities and focus in experimentation. And secondly, we have experiments that have other than two treatments, such as AA experiment or multivariate experiment. So we needed to implement some extra steps for those experiments, and luckily the implementation was pretty straightforward. And lastly, at Etsy, we have a lot more data on weekdays compared to on weekend. It's not a concern for the approach that we ultimately chose, but for a lot of the methods, um, for example, the uh, for example, PCOG and OBF, they will require equal data sample size. Um, for 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 those methods, um, to, um, in order to get equal data sample size, there is an R package called Group Seek, and we can easily call it in Python. So this is the end of my talk. Um, my team and I learned a lot through the project, especially about the balance between statistical rigorousness and practical constraints, because we did look into some more rigorous models and methods, but we couldn't really apply them because of the constraints uh, we have around experimentation at Etsy. Um, and this work is a collaboration between my colleague Callie McCree and I, and we want to give a special shout out to the analytics and data engineering teams at Etsy. Thank you. Thank you.